let's just um, look at the chords really quick. I was thinking about this, like I don't want to go too much into theory. Like I can, I can really dork out with theory because um, I find it really fascinating the way chords comment on one another and the power that you have as a creator if you kind of understand the nuts and bolts of why chords work together, why some chords work together. Um, this is just like the square one explanation of that. And there's some advanced songwriters like Crystal and Pete out there that are just gonna be like, maybe go get a cup of coffee. But, um, but uh, this song is in uh, A minor and, um, and A minor is the relative minor of C. That's not terribly important, but I say that because the same chords that work for the key of C major, uh, C, F, G, uh, also work for A minor. When you're writing a song in C, you would think of this as like uh, one, C, four is the F, five, and then you get your six. And um, that'll carry you a long way. Those four chords like form, I'd say like 75% of all pop music and 95% of all Taylor Swift songs. Um, <clears throat> so with, when, so you can, my point is that you can use the same chords. Um, so if you're thinking about writing a song in minor and you've never done it before, we'll use those four chords, A minor, F, G, C, write it down if you want. Here's the, the other little twist that you can do, and this is what I do in paper cuts, um, is that <clears throat> the uh, five chord of A minor is E. Um, e major, E, is not in the key of C if I were to play. Obviously, there's a note in there that sounds not, not um, like it belongs to the others. Um, what that note is is the G sharp. Um, it's not terribly important, but the relationship between the A minor chord and the E major chord is important because this E major chord, what it wants to do is resolve. It wants to resolve so badly to A minor. You hear that? Of course you do. Um, and why that is is that that, <clears throat> that leading that mm, the the E major chord has a G sharp in it, and that G sharp is the leading tone they call that. That's pushing to the one of of A. It's that G sharp is pushing to the to the A note in the A minor chord. And it's so powerful. It's it just it desperately wants to resolve there. So if I'm like, it's we don't we're not home yet. We got to go. Oh, okay, now we're home. Now it feels good again. Um, you can also thwart that uh, by. Um, not playing in A minor. And uh, that is often done in songs. This is just a really quick aside. Um, a common a common thwarting or a common substitution of that A minor in a chord progression in folk and pop music would be to play an F instead of an, an A minor. So I'll play that for you right here. Of a trick, well, you know, it's like your ear wanted to hear this, but instead I went. Um, cool, anyway. Uh, so put that in your pocket, you can write that down and do it, it'll work every time. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. What I wanted to say with paper cuts, I saved that E for I think I play it three times in the whole song. So um, that's another way to kind of, if, you, if you're going to use a chord that's special, let's say, um, use it once in a while. And you, what you're really telling your audience, your listener, even though they don't know this, is that like, 
here's the moment of the song. Here is the dramatic point um, that is, is t that is anchoring this song. Let's say you're saying that musically. And so where I save that, all the verse chords in um, Paper Cuts are all the normal chords that are common to the key of C. And it's not until I get to the chorus, giving myself paper cuts, making wings to fly me to you. All of those chords are all in C. Now I'm no no folded dreams can make for me a way to be with you. So I wait till the very last chord of the chorus to play the five chord of, e, of A minor for the very first time. So it just is like, it grabs your ear and it throws us hard, throws us like securely back into the key of A minor. It just, it, another way to say that is it pulls us back into the darkness as strongly as possible. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, just kind of cruising through here. If anyone has any uh, uh, comments or questions to just speak of at any time, I think I'll be able to hear you. I'm trying to be, you know, inclusive as much as possible as much as you can be in a zoom thing um let's see here there's one more moment in the chords just to discuss this idea um so i like i told you the uh the four chords that are common to a minor and c uh c f g a minor and uh that's the, there's another one that i use in paper cuts which is the d minor which would be uh a two chord in C and a little bit of an uncommon chord, not too uncommon, but um, in A minor, it's the four chord. None of this really matters. You don't have to, there's not gonna be a quiz, but I do wanna point out that uh, the, the selective use of the less common chords um, has a nice way of resetting the, the listener's ear in a way that's not in their face. Um, and I do that there's a little, there's a couple of moments of me using the D minor in the chorus, but <clears throat> I really use it uh, to a stronger effect on purpose in the bridge, where the bridge chords are basically the, the, the chorus. Let me think about this. Already won. Oh, the, the bridge is basically a slightly simpler version of the verse chords. So the bridge is barely, it's not even really a bridge in terms of like a new set of chords, but um, what's happening, why the bridge uh, to my mind works is that it's kind of where the song comes undone a little bit. And uh, the, vo the vocal register, the melody register goes up and it gets kind of desperate sounding. Um, it, the whole song is very moody and dark. And then in the bridge, it's like the guy's kind of coming on cool. And uh, it's already one in the morning. It's too late for you to go home. Don't you think, do you think that you can stay here? And will you whisper little words of well done? I'm glad tidings lie beside me. So what I, I threw this D minor chord in that bridge because I wanted to give it a little bit more and I wanted it to kind of create a false landing before we got into the chorus. So, um, cause it, I, I, I felt like throwing those like crazy emotions right up against the, um, the last chorus was maybe a little too stark. Sometimes it's exciting to juxtapose, juxtapose um, contrasting moods and slam them right against each other. That'll um, grab your, your listeners ear and just create a lot of dynamic tension in the song. But um, in this case, I kind of wanted it to like have a, a settling feel um, to get me out of that, uh, the, the bridge is wildness, let's say. Um, and so that was an, a way to do that, was to play this D minor chord, which I barely had done in the song. 
trying to go kind of fast so we can cover some material and um i also uh don't want to spend too much time on the courts so that's all the time on the courts good job okay lyric mm. this is my this is the hardest part of all songwriting to me because it's really i'm a fan i think we all are kind of fans of words um as our tastes in songwriting um no, I noticed this took me like 15 years in the business to realize that like not everyone's like that. Not everyone actually listens to the words to songs. It's mostly just like some people are just like, man, I just like something that makes me tap my toes. That's totally fine. Um, most people are really just like trying to get through the day and they don't like <clears throat> read a lot of books or care about that stuff too much. And they just want something that like is a nice thing to feel on the way to dropping the kids off at soccer practice which is the explanation for all of modern country music that's not even a dig that's just like people are busy right um well, I'm, i don't know why i'm going on about that well i maybe i am because this has been a lesson to me to not be so precious uh and i think that sometimes um there's this, this expectation in folk singing particularly that's like i have a song to sing and you need to listen to me play my song that i have to sing and i don't really feel that way i feel like it's i'm damn lucky if i have anyone's attention for one second and i think that it's there's this funny thing that you're writing when you when you write a folk type of song or a singer songwriter song which is that the best ones are you recognize the singer in the song you're like that's a song that only crystal and pete could write or that's a song that only amy Spees could write or that's a song that only richard thompson could write um but at the same time uh that it's not i'll just speak from my perspective the the best songs that i write i feel like are are my song um but they're also your song they're also tell that person's story and um, that's what, uh, you know, pop songs do really well. That's why they're, they sell a lot more copies than sometimes folk music or, or country songs because they're not even trying to um, put the songwriter in the song. It's 100% your song. And um, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're writing a song is that um, you want to say something that you feel, but you also want to have a, a basic consideration for your listener. You're trying to, to tell them something, um, not about yourself, but ultimately about themselves. That's good advice, Corby. Okay. Um, all right, so the, the lyric. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I have a bunch of different feelings about lyrics and um, I'm still learning and growing myself as a lyric, lyricist and a songwriter. Um, in fact, I got on this tear uh, last night. This is only a tiny aside. I have no idea what time it is. The phone doesn't tell me anymore. Uh, hold on. <clears throat> okay. okay, so we're about halfway through. We're okay. Um, I got on this tear last night about um, the, the theme song to Cheers because I'm gonna about, about to post it on my IGTV thing. So I was just like re revisiting my version and being like, ah, it's okay, okay. But then I was uh, I was reading an interview with the the guy Gary who wrote the song this guy Gary Portnoy, and um, wait, why did I, I had an idea for what I wanted to tell you about this? Um, Forwarding expectations. Everything you got, we should tell a lot. Um. I'm losing the thread on the Cheers connection, guys. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, okay, so we'll just go with what I was gonna say originally, which was about thwarting expectations in uh, dramatic songwriting. Um, oh yeah, I I'm still growing as a songwriter. I was listening to Gary Portnoy's Cheers theme song, which is like 
totally emblematic of everything I just said. It's your song. When you hear that, it's our song when we hear that song. We relate to every single moment lyrically in the song. And it puts you in the place you just want to go where everybody knows your name. Who doesn't feel that way? That is an amazing, amazing, perfect song. That guy wrote that when he was like 26 years old and made his whole life, made his whole career on that one song. Um, anyway, so I aspire to write a song that's that universal and true. Um, in my case, for pa paper cuts, um, what, did I, what was I thinking? A lot of times when I write a song, and this is, I think, a good thing to keep in mind, is um, don't worry about getting too clever. It's nice to have a clever line. There's maybe one clever moment in this song, but it's actually like my least favorite part of the song. I'll tell you about that in a second. But um, most of this song is really about a straightforward delivery of the narrator's position on the matter, let's say. And um, so the song opens up, I want you, I miss you, I need you, honey. I am the man who was meant to be your lover. We're like, okay, we know who this guy is. He feels really strongly about this girl or person. Uh, I want you, I miss you, I need you, honey. I am the man who was meant to be your lover. It's like, okay, we know who this is. The next line, I hate you. Don't ever want to see you again. And if I do, I will make like I don't know you. We're like, okay. Um, why to me that's that lyric works is because it sets you up you know who this guy is and then right after that it's like smack the guy says the opposite thing and you immediately you're you're kind of startled because you feel like this song is going to be one kind of song this is guy like that's putting his heart out there saying um just laying it all bare and then in the very next moment he takes it all back and he tells the other side, I hate you. I don't ever want to see you again. I'll pretend like I don't even know you if I do. This is like the complete coldest thing. And um, I think that what's really happening is uh, the true picture of that narrator is, is in between those, those lines, is, is, this, is the, um, the sum total of those two halves of that first verse, which you're like, whoa, this guy feels really strongly and he's clearly been rejected and he hates her. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think that it works on one level because uh, it subjug sub sub subjugates dramatic expectations, subverts dramatic expectation, which is so such an ancient dramatic practice. It goes back to, Plato, Aristotle, and before. Um, so it always works to set something, an expectation up for the audience and then subvert it in a way that surprises them. Um, that's one little trick. But the real picture of why I think that the, these two halves of this verse work is that it creates a complicated narrator, um, a person who wants two things. And it also is something that I think that people recognize in themselves. Everyone's been Everyone's felt emotionally torn um, between uh, loving someone or something and recognizing that they're being tortured by that very love. So there's a, there's a something, I don't know. There's, <clears throat> I've never explored, I've never like analyzed this song ever until this moment. Like, so this is sort of difficult for me to do, like articulate these things. Um, but I hope that it is, somewhat useful um, okay so uh, I hate you I never want to see you again if I do I will make like I don't know you it's all or nothing with me baby and I won't ever let you love me um, <clears throat> you, you kind of get it again those next two lyrics like develop uh, the character in a sense that you see that this is an extreme person um, he's she's uh, not not really wishy-washy in her uh, in her emotional uh, let's say uh, conception of her this relationship uh, <clears throat> so and then that I will never let you love me and then that sets up the course giving myself paper cuts 
making wings to fly me to you. I, now I know no folded dreams can make for me a way to be with you. Da, da, da. So it's very simple. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a little thing too that I try to keep in mind I don't always use. But I read an interview with Iggy Pop once, um, the great pop songwriter. And uh, I do like Iggy Pop's music and I like his spirit an awful lot. Um, <clears throat> But he said that, and I can't remember if this was like just an exercise for a while he did, but he said something about like, my songs, I try to have my songs have 21 words or less. 21 words is all you get. If you need more than 21 words, you're using too many words. And so like to say, you know, you love me, 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 that would be you love me. That's three words. So you can repeat words and it doesn't count against you, but you only get you only get to use 21 words in a song. Um, that's a fun exercise to try sometime. Um, and uh, I'm always kind of trying to par parse down um, the lyric. Um, there was a time when I was younger when I was trying to impress people with like how many words I could put into a song um, <clears throat> where I would like let those, like, there would be a lot of words to, to the songs. And, here's the advantage of that is that you can really develop a picture. I mean, um, 52 Vincent Black Lightning by Richard Thompson has the whole bunch of words in it. And man, I'm so glad that every single one of those words is there because they all create this very compelling picture that, that develops across four very long verses. And um, so there's obviously always going to be a place for uh, a verbose song. <laughs> Um, or a lyrically complicated or a, a lyrically elaborate song. Um, I have just found that I like songs that are easy to like. And um, I mean, I'm also just in a season right now, you know, um, where I into uh, less being more. So uh, the verse, the, the course of paper cuts is kind of an example of that. Given myself paper cuts. So there's a little bit of an art, arty moment there. There's a little metaphor. Okay, you're like, okay, this guy's not literally giving himself paper cuts. But uh, giving myself paper cuts, making wings to fly me to you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. Oh, <clears throat> I'm also texting while I talk. Uh, making wings to fly me to you. Now I know no folded dreams can make for me a way to be with you. Make for me a way to be with you is like the dumb dummiest rhymes ever. Like me and C and we, I'm rhyming all, what am I, make for me a way to be. I'm rhyming me and be. Um, and it totally works because it's just like, it's easy on your ear, you know? Um, you don't have to like make some kind of clever runs. In fact, a lot of times, put your cleverness in inside the verse, but make your rhyme obvious. Um, if you make your rhyme weird, it stands out all of a sudden. It just it like draws attention to itself. And anything in your song that draws attention to itself apart from the overall impression of the song detracts from the power of the song. Um, so giving myself paper cuts, making me wings to fly me to you. Now I know no folded dreams can make for me a way to be with you. Okay, here's another problem with that course is that um, I rhyme you and you. That's pretty weak, but it's, I don't know. It's like kind of okay because the, the you is sort of stuck on in both of those halves of that chorus um, as an ad addendum to the real rhymes, which are um, me, wings are the the strong rhymes and I put that little bit on the end um I don't know why it just felt like it worked so this is my saying that like I do this a couple times sometimes I'll rhyme the same word with the same word um and it's not like it wouldn't be approved by Don Henley of the Eagles but uh he wasn't there when I wrote the song and I've sung, you know, some of these songs I've sung a number of times and I still enjoy them and they still seem to work. So I think that there's always, with everything I'm saying, these are sort of principles and not rules. And 
all of the joy or a lot of the joy and a lot of the power in any kind of creative act, but including songwriting, is in breaking those rules and trusting, not, to, not for their own sake, but always, always defer to your intuition over a principle or a rule. If your gut says it feels right, go with it. Um, that's my take on the thing. So I'm sure that somebody else would be like, mm. um, Pat Patterson would be like, excuse me, Corby, <laughs> that is not correct. Um, Pat Patterson is a great songwriter. He wrote a book that um, you should get called Writing Better Lyrics. And I love the guy and he has made me a better songwriter. And um, I'm just poking a little bit. Okay, so there's that lyric, uh, thwarting expectations, strong. The second verse, I just power through this a little bit. Um, verse two um you're not my keepsake i'm not your property so don't bother me girl i don't really want you around um it's only love it's just a foolish thing and no it's never really worth the suffering um obviously the i kind of reverse the position of the narrator where in the first verse all positive i love you followed by i hate you all negative the second verse since i we knew the cat was out of the bag for the listener. I knew that um, the listener was like, okay, this guy's struggling here. So I just stuck with, with the struggling images uh, top of the, and throughout really the whole of the second verse. So it's all just like, you're, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> uh, I didn't want you around anyway, kind of stuff. And then that's followed by, the pre-course right there um oh but don't you love keep saying my property so don't bother me girl i don't really want you around it's only love it's just a foolish thing and no it's never really worth the suffering oh but don't you love me baby it's still just wishes that she was around if only you would love me. Now I realize that I'm giving myself. I put those extra words in there, but that's you know what's happening. It goes back to the course. He's giving himself paper cuts. Oh no, he's making me now. Is there any way to be with you? Um, touching on an arrangement moment. This is. I don't want to make this too complicated. Um, for the second time, sometimes it's nice if you're going to write a song to do something a little different structurally in the second, in the, the second time of the course comes around or the second verse even. Um, maybe, and I didn't do this in this particular situation, the verse length of verse one and the verse length of verse two are the same. But that's not to say the song might've been a little tighter if I had cut the second verse in half and just gone, gotten back to the chorus quick. Um, that's something that you can do. Uh, you can also, a fun thing to do in a hook is um, uh, write this write the hook slightly differently in the second chorus. I don't. I think that's a little bit dangerous. I think you should almost always leave the hook alone. Um, a better technique would be to to make the hook that's the same mean something different as the song goes out. Like um, Bob Dylan's "Tangled Up in Blue." is such a masterpiece example of that where tang the, the hook tangled up in blue um has come to mean something different with regard to each verse um that came before it um recommended listening for when we're done uh okay but um in this case i did something different where after the second chorus i just i wanted it to land i didn't want to go right back into the da -da -da -da. i felt like that was like okay listeners come to expect that um let's not let him have let let him or her have that uh expectation fulfilled and so i just i just let the i put a bar of um an f chord in there so that it kind of like is a holding pattern and then i went back into the ba 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 so how that went was made for me a way to be with you with you ba -ba -da. um i don't think that you would ever have noticed that i did that except that i pointed it out um but all of these things that you're trying to do is alchemists of sound and, and, and lyric is 
you're doing your it's all magic it's all you all want it to be behind the scenes so that the listener doesn't notice any of these techniques they're just going with the song you're just trying to keep that listener's attention all the way through the song and also give them something to feel that hopefully they feel afterwards when they remember your song because it was so hooky um, and they can kind of sing it back to themselves and they have a little bit of an echo of that feeling that they had while they were listening um, okay, so there's that. Then a word to the bridge. It's already okay. So this is, this is. I feel like the cheapest moment of the whole song, but it's also the most. I mean, once in a while, people will say something about this song, and they, this is what they say when uh, about it. It's like it's already one in the morning. It's too late for you to go home. They're like, I really like the way that you mid two means something different. Um, that's not the way. The, person talks maybe they did i can't remember but um so right there i i let two i made i set up this expectation again uh, it's already one in the morning it's two and then maybe it's going to be like it's two in the morning now because it's even later but instead i just like it's too late for you to go home which is just you know like uh, obviously i'm just making swapping out a different two um, which I felt like is borderline cheap trick, um, borderline little schoolyard hijinks. But, um, you know, I, it, it seemed to work when I did it. And then when I played it, people liked that moment or what. I don't know. Um, so there's another thing you could do is make a word mean something different or use the homonym, homonym of the word and then use that word as a pivot to go somewhere different. Um, really, in that case, I'm it's it's not really going a different direction it's just sort of underscoring the first line it's already one in the morning it's too late for you to go home um don't you think do you think that you could stay here and will you whisper little words of welcome and glad tidings lie beside me i think that's all kind of weird um but i liked it i like this idea of whisper little words of welcome this is like there's some um it's not onomatopoeia. Somebody can tell me what that is when it's um, the same words. Uh, I, I kind of failed English. Um, word, words, whisper words of welcome it has a nice little lyrical flow to it. And then glad tidings lie beside me. Um, alliteration. Thank you, Heather. Smarty pants. Um, yes, the alliteration. Um, very good use of alliteration, Corby. Um, glad tidings lie beside me. Um, I think it's just sort of an archaic thing to say, but um, I liked it. Um, again, it's just like one of those things where you just trust your gut and you let it go. Um, or will or will my love sleep alone again? If in my self paper cuts. Um, so there's the lyrics of the songs, and uh, I'm kind of about out of things to say about it. So um, I'll say one other thing, and um, this kind of related to my idea of using fewer song or fewer words rather than more, if you can help it. Um, there's two reasons why that's kind of powerful is because it draws attention to the words that you do use. But also, and maybe more importantly, it creates a lot of space in your song. And space is what people need to to disappear into your song and also to process the words that you do use. So if you say a bunch of words um, and you give your listener no time, um, they're gonna, they're, they're, you're in danger of losing them. And um, whereas if you put, if you, if you put, if you don't ask too much, it's all about not asking too much of your listener. Um, but creating a space for them to, yeah, just to process the song. So I do that. I mean, I do that in almost all of, I do that a lot in my songwriting now, but, um, and you can also get away with it. Like, don't be afraid to repeat things a lot. If you have a hook, um, uh, a hook, if it's really sticky, um, I don't think that you should worry too much about letting it ride and um, letting that stick really 
really stick in the listener. Um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, that can be banal, but also it can be powerful. It's a fine line. Anyway, um, for this, for paper cuts, just to stick it out. Uh, I want you, I miss you, I need you, honey. I am the man who is meant to be your lover. So um, I am the man who is meant to be your lover. It's like a little bit wordy right there, it, but it's only wordy in comparison to what came before it. So like, just, I want you, I miss you, I need you, honey is very easy and it asks very little. And even after I say that, I am the man who is meant to be your lover. Boom. I hate you. Now we're back to the same pat the same phrasing pattern. And I do that all the time too. Um, it's one thing to, to create rhymes in songs, but a really nice, um, an elegant song, and I'm gonna say that paper cuts is elegant, but it's, I try for this, is to have a very consistent lyrical balance in your song because it's again it's a kind of repetition it's a kind of rhyme to use similar phrasing throughout the song so in this case i want you i miss you i need you honey da 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 and then it's right back i hate you um and then i kind of break from that but it's at least it, that i hate you really sticks out and uh or, or really sticks the the whole phrasing again. It's it just like keeps us right there, and then I kind of subvert it right after that. So I hate you. Don't ever want to see you again. Um, I think that that works uh, because it's a phrase that's common common vernacular. People would say that I don't ever want to see you again. Everyone knows what that means. That's a terrible thing to hear or to say to somebody. Uh, don't ever want to see you again. And if I do, I will make like I don't know you. It's like damn, dude. That's cold. Um, <clears throat> all right. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of sick of hearing myself talk about my stuff. So, um, I, does anyone have any questions? Maybe the, I can just open this up. Um, maybe you already talked about this. Okay. Oh, here we go. But do you write the lyrics first or the melody or does it just depend on the song? It depends on the song. And, um, I don't know, uh, the, the, really the thing is for most of the songs and this is not an example of that um i was just telling one of my students uh this last week that i'm the i'm the guy in the band i'm the, like the lead singer in the band who wishes he was the guitar player and so i'm always trying to find something that's fun on a guitar and once I find that, I'll hold on to that for years sometimes until it finds its way into a song. Um, and so I oftentimes, this is for me, but I, I have like a, a uh, I, I go for the, some, some riffy thing first that's fun to play. And then after, out of that usually comes some idea of a melody. And, um, uh, and then, then the lyrics, because to me, the lyrics are by far the hardest thing. And um, God, I, I mean, I really just like wish that, I wish that I didn't have to write lyrics. <laughs> it would be so much easier because <laughs> it's really fun to play music, but it's not that fun to write songs because it's hard. And um, so, uh, yeah, it depends on the song. And usually, um, and I encourage you to, if you're a songwriter, to have, you know, you got to be, you got to have some facility on your instrument of choice. And the more facility you have, the more ways that you can go with songwriting. Um, and you don't have to be a, a good guitar player necessarily, but I think it helps to have, uh, it helps to be competent on guitar, at least quarterly. Um, because then you can just be, you can strum along and you can just see what you want to say, you know. Hey, I don't feel so good. I wanna go chop some wood. I don't know. I'm not really good on the fly. Okay, uh, but you can. But the, I think that when you write a song, a really important thing to have is to put yourself in sort of a gentle frame of mind. I, you got to get away from your computer, and you got to throw your phone across the room or in a different room, or turn it off. Um, because a hundred times while you're writing a song, you're going to want to check your messages because it's way easier 
to check your messages than to think of the difficult sticking point of your song. Um, I just really think it's super important to minimize, not only minimize distraction, but create a, a space in your, in your room or, but also in your mind that's, that can cook, that can bend, that it's a little bit like you want to be breezy when you set out to write a song because you don't know what's going to happen. And you, you're, you're, if you're like me, you're going to tend to be too hard on yourself and you're going to tend to like hate everything or you're going to be too easy on yourself maybe. And I think that just like you're working with something that's bigger than you when you sit down to write a song. And um, it's important to be open to that and to let the song show you what it is. I think that's really important. Okay, I've gotten some more. Um, uh oh. Okay, I don't know how. How do I get to my chat page again? Uh, Chris is asking tips on getting through writer's block. Hmm. Um. Okay really quickly how do i okay okay there's something i can okay check i just want okay see the chat stuff okay um writer's block yeah that's a tough one man um i don't know and i think that a lot of times i mean there's like a hundred different strategies and or strategies strategy is not even like the right word in my case. There's a hundred different desperate flailing acts <laughs> that you can try. And I think a lot of times it comes down to setting something down for a minute, um, but not permanently. And um, a minute could mean a minute or a week, or as is the case in some things that I do, um, seven or eight years. Uh, it's really hard to know that stuff. Um, I, I, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just like a baby at this. I feel like I'm totally struggling all the time with writer's block, with creating stuff that's bad and that I ultimately abandon or don't abandon, finish, publish, share with other people, and then realize in hindsight that it's not my best work. And then I'm just, I'm like terrified and embarrassed and I don't ever want to do it again. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and uh, anyway, okay, no, be encouraging, be encouraging. Well, that is encouraging because um, everybody feels like this, I feel like. I mean, if you're gonna be bold enough to try to create something from nothing, I already salute you and I'm totally in your corner. And I just think you're so brave because it is an act of wanton bravery to, to try to do something like write a song. So you already have my highest praise and not even joking. Um, and then, yeah, so you like, so sometimes it's not a bad idea to write, just go do something else. Um, sometimes if I'm like, if I'm really, trying to crank i'm really trying to finish a song or it's under deadline um something i'll do is free you know free associate right um i do this a lot um just pen and paper and uh write down as best i can without like over without thinking about it, just like keep the pen moving what am i trying to say what am i trying to say here and just you know being very forgiving um about not trying to be clever like don't try to be clever try to be true and um that trueness will 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 translate um so yeah the free association thing is is helpful um a lot of times you know if i'm like stuck on a rhyme um i will do like a thing where i just free associate rhyming you know and i i just well i found that and this is why i said this earlier is that um you know not nine times out of 10, but seven times out of 10, say, the, the obvious rhyme is the correct one. If it's love, the rhyme is of. Maybe glove. Those are your two choices. Um, and, uh, but if there's a lot of things that you can put in between of and love, 
that make it your own and make it not a totally banal, dumb, dumb, throw in the waste paper bag song. Okay, um, that was some, some tips, maybe, Chris? Okay, um, distractions, okay. It is real, distractionless work, yeah. Always swimming across the river of suck. <laughs> oh my God, isn't that the truth? Um, anyway, okay, uh, thanks so much, Tom Hardy is going to totally change now. Okay, so many wonderful tips. I'm listening on the road from sec. Oh, that's so great. I'm so glad that you took me along. Um, yeah, and I would say too, there's a lot of things I do uh, that, that feed the songwriting when I'm not actively songwriting. I mean, I, and I think this is important. You, as an as a creative person, your 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 title as creative person does not begin and end with the actual act of being creative. Um, you should not. You should think about your whole life as a creative journey, and that you know, you're not, this is not like whipping yourself into submission and always having to create. Um, but it's rather like <clears throat> just kind of trying to cultivate that spirit of, of receptivity and breeziness. I think that's, I think I'm going to stick to that um, analogy because it's a really good way of thinking about um, the way I try to live even when I'm not actively creating. So you're like, um, I do a lot of things. I mean, I, I keep a daily journal um, and this isn't to say I haven't missed an entry in 20 years or anything, but um, it is part of my like spiritual practice. So first thing in the morning, I just write a page and or two pages or half a page. I'm not, it's more about just the act of showing up again and just kind of creating a habit of expressing myself um truly let's say in an in a safe environment where like no one's ever going to read these journals um, with one terrible notable exception in my past but um i i write them as though no one will ever read them and uh and in fact i never read them i never read them again um so but that that habit of just like coming in touch with you know my the yesterday's experiences or today's stuff or deep shit or like my childhood whatever is just like presents itself in the morning um i just write without without thinking about it um and i'm in a season right now where i'm praying a lot so i like write down my prayers and that can mean whatever it means to you but i find that um for me like the act of pen on paper is the best thing about it is that it provides um i'm just not distracted when i'm writing if i'm actually writing the words out that requires concentration and so my mind isn't totally wandering where if, the, if i sit there then i'll think about 10 things in one second you know as we all do so that's been helpful i also read a lot of fiction um and uh i watch some tv um, although I, I don't watch as much as I would like to, I kind of, um, because I'm doing some TV stuff right now, uh, I feel there's just so much out there. But um, like right now, I'm really into this show called Norsemen, um, which is sort of like a combination of Game of Thrones and Monty Python. And uh, it is, it's like made me bellow laugh a few times. Anyway. Um, just i would say be selective as much as you can about how you spend your time and um you're always kind of cultivating you're always sort of like preparing yourself to show up for the next time so that when you do show up to create your your whole self you know you want to be all of you when you're in that moment trying to tell you to say something true be it to yourself or your audience okay that was a lot of talking word economy yeah Emily, Emily Dickinson, amazing. Um, I need to get in to her more. I have a book of hers. I mean, yeah, that's like, there's, I can't even talk intelligently about high poetry like Dickinson, but um, there's, I mean, it's just, it's just funny. Songwriting is also a, um, in a category of its own in that it, it, it's for those of us 
who were kind of in between worlds. Um, maybe we have a knack for language or we're interested in language, but, but most of us aren't like actual poets or you don't sit and maybe, I'm just gonna speak for myself. I never read poetry and I always think that I should. And I once or twice a year buy a book of poetry being like, I'm gonna elevate myself. I'm gonna, you know, really get in there. And um, I never do. Um, Dickinson's actually pretty accessible, so I should try again. And she is the master of leaving things out. Um, but it's that's to say, it's like songwriting its own thing, you know? Um, I don't think that Dylan read a lot of poetry. Um, I don't want to speculate on that, but I just, we as songwriters have to be kind of gentle on ourselves because we're not virtuosos of music, nor are we poet laureates. We're something in between. And I think that's what I like so much about songwriting, the discipline of it and the pursuit of it. And it's a high, high art form precisely because it's a kind of a, a very odd amalgam of two disparate worlds. And it's also grounded in the common person's experience. Um, you, you, as songwriters, we're not trying to write something that you have to have a PhD to understand. We're trying to write something that the average Joe who hears you receives himself and, um, or herself, the Jolene, average Joe. Um, and I think that that's really noble and I think it's really difficult. And I actually, you know, so far it's provided me a lifetime of um, opportunity and challenge. So um, good job, songwriters. Does anyone have any other questions? Otherwise, I will sign off because I've been, oh, it's been an hour. Um, in any case, uh, I'm going to close this thing. Okay. All right. Well, um, I guess we're done then. And um, thanks for tuning up, tuning in. And I hope that you got something out of it. Um, I have some ideas coming up. If you want to do, oh yeah, if you want to do any one-on-one -on -one lesson stuff, um, we can do one lesson or 20, I don't care. Um, hit me up and you can reply. There's whatever, there's a million ways to get a hold of me. And um, the other thing is I'm going to do, I think I'm going to two weeks from now, I'm going to do a guitar course, um, an intro to Mississippi John Hurt style of guitar playing because I love and could listen to him all day long. Both his personality, um, but his approach to finger style guitar, uh, I, that was my big, um, when I started out, this is what kind of opened the world up to me as a songwriter who wanted to do something a little bit more melodic with my guitar playing, but it's also very accessible. And um, I think I could get, get you rolling um, on that. And we'll probably do that two weeks from now. So I'll, I'll post about that and let you know, and probably post some songs that feature that style of guitar playing in the meantime. So that's my whole show. Thanks a lot for tuning in.